yeah, we can get started and people will still be coming in. So welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on and attending this afternoon's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, just a few things to note. Please let me know in the chat if you have any technical issues that I can try to resolve. And if you have any questions or comments, please use the Q&A button. Uh, this program is made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. And I'd like to now introduce Ashley Rooney, the past president of the Lexington Field and Garden Club. Uh, Ashley has been the host of our gardening series for the last year and a half, bringing innumerable gardening experts to the library to answer all of our gardening questions. Uh, so now please welcome Ashley. Thank you, Matt. And today, my another innumerable gardening expert is Terry Hale. Uh, who's going to talk to us about trees. She's going to give us her 12 favorite trees and some favorite vines and her 12 favorite shrubs. And if she has time left, she will give 12 more. And believe me, this is important. I go to parties and people ask me what tree I should plant. And it's very important when you're figuring out what you're planting and where your trees are going to go. Um, so hopefully she, you can learn some stuff from this program. And if not, uh, Terry usually gives you her email and you can contact her afterwards. So Terry, why don't you take it away? Okay, so I'm going to um, <clears throat> do the share screen here. And we wait for the share there screen. It's here. coming up now. Okay. Um, So I'm beginning with Acer, and Acer is actually maple. And th th these um, are Japanese maples. And there are many variations of foliage and uh, colors. This happens to be a mounding one that is a very low growing tree. And it has a threadly foliage, um, which is similar to this one here. Actually, it's the same tree. The first slide was in the fall. This is in the spring. How high does it grow? It grows about um, three feet tall and it spreads uh, to about five feet. So it's great for a slope. Yeah. Okay. Um, one thing about the Japanese maples, they are slow growing, um, but they're worth, they're worth it. They take time before they um, reach their total height. They're very delicate, very lacy. Another form of Japanese, I don't have the exact varieties of, of the names, but this is just to give you an idea when you go shopping um, that you can um, pick out a lot of interesting um, trees in the Japanese maple um, category. This is moving on to redbud or cirsus. The nice thing about the red bud is in the early spring, um, you know, when you're discouraged after winter, uh, the red bud begins blooming and it's just so cheery. The flowers bloom along the stems and they're usually pink reddish, as you can see here. And they come in all different um, shapes. And this one happens to be forest pansy and it has a, a very lush wine red foliage. Mm -hmm. um, it stays this color throughout the growing season. And this particular tree needs to be somewhat protected when you plant it. And it's great um, beneath another tree if it isn't too shaded. Hmm. It's a pretty color. Yeah. Um, the red buds, the cirsus, um, also come in, you know, different heights. They come weeping. So there's many, many varieties to pick from. Moving along, this is a cornus cusa. This is one of my favorite trees. It, the, I have grown this tree as multi-stemmed, as you can see um, down here. It's not a single stem, but most of them are grown single stem. It's covered with white flowers in June. In the fall, it has this brilliant red foliage, and it also has red fruits that the birds and the squirrels love. Is this the, the other advantage of this tree is that it has exfoliating bark. 
So in the winter, you get the beauty of the back. This is another cornice. This cornice is cornice mass, our Carillion cherry. And it blooms before Forsythia, covered with those bright yellow flowers. Mm -hmm. And in the fall, it has this fruit. The fruit supposedly is edible, but um, you'd have to be, um, uh, have a pretty uh, developed taste bud to be able to tolerate it. It's very dry and acidic. Do the birds eat it? Uh, no, they don't, seem, they don't seem to eat it. It seems to fall to the ground. I think it might be too acidic for them as well. Okay. Um, and this is another cornice. This one is called Venus. And they're developing a, a lot more varieties of the cornice as ornamental trees. It uh, blooms for a very, very long period of time. This is a very young tree. This was um, this tree here is only about five years old, and it, it blooms profu profusely every year. And I don't know its full height, so I'm waiting to see what happens as it matures. Moving on to ginkgo. Ginkgo is good as a street tree. You see them used in cities often. It has um, beautiful fan-like foliage, as you can see here, um, and turns bright yellow in the fall. In the spring and during the summer, it is a medium shade of green, which is kind of contrasting with many of the dark greens. This is Halicia or Carolina Silverbell. This tree um, is grown in a woodland area on my property and it's covered with beautiful silver bells in May. Mm. Very easy to grow. And now this is probably one of my favorite trees too, along with the cornice. This is a um, Sosophilium uh, Japonicum Katsura and more commonly known as the Katsura tree. And as it buds out in the spring, the foliage looks like it's pink. And uh, here it is full grown. This tree happens to be an enormous tree. Uh, however, the Katsuras are now grown to be medium and shorter sized trees and then weeping uh, variations. So I wanted to show you this slide particularly. As you can see, the foliage is very close to this um, viburnum here. It's trimmed very low, but I trimmed it up. And here it is trimmed up with the same viburnum so that you can see through it, and, um, which gives it a totally different look. And you can do this with many of your trees. So this kind of opens up yeah. that area um, from being closed off to being open. Yep. And I wanted to show you a close up of the foliage because it has these beautiful heart shaped leaves. And in the fall, it turns a brilliant yellow every fall faithfully. And when it turns this color yellow, it smells like burnt sugar or cotton candy. So you have that sensual smell as well. Hmm. And here it is, the, um, the tree again, trimmed up in the fall in its um, full glory. That's cool. And in the winter, the branches are such that when they collect snow, it's just as beautiful. So mm -hmm. that's um, the Katsura tree, which I highly recommend. Okay, moving on to the golden fringe tree. I'm not even gonna try to pronounce the Latin name because it's just too difficult. So in the spring, this tree uh, has um, these falling sprigs of um, yellow flowers. Thus, it's called the golden chain. It's a very airy tree. It's a tree I would recommend for um, um, a, you know, having the effect of a tree without being shady. And in the fall, it has these um, very, very interesting seed pods. Um, which cover the tree, and you can use them as decorations. And here is the um, fall uh, color of the foliage. Very, and you can see how airy it is. It's very 
you know, a very delicate looking tree. Hmm. And this is a, a parada. And I first saw this tree at Mount Auburn Cemetery and it's known for its colorful foliage in the fall. It also has an, you know, an interesting leaf structure. So it's not boring when it's green. And here it is again um, in the fall. Um, and you can see the structure of it. It's a medium sized height tree. And again, more of the foliage of the, of the, the wow. parada. Okay, this tree is a prunus. And I don't especially recommend prunus except for this one because it's very long blooming. And this tree can also be grown as a shrub. And it starts out with um, these beautiful white flowers, um, all very dainty and they turn kind of pinkish. And here it is again, you can see how um, beautiful the flowers are and they last a very, very long time. The uh, tree trunk structure too has very interesting bark. Um, so, um, and I, I met uh, the name of this variety is, uh, I believe I said is Hallie Jovalet. And I met Hallie at um, my garden tour in Beacon Hill and fell in love with her. Yeah. And this is uh, Stewardia. Stewardia is a slow growing tree, has again, very, very interesting bark. It can grow very tall. It's not a quick grower but it's a lovely tree and it has these flowers that look like um, camellias to me. And I'm showing you this tree because I don't recommend it. Now you may think that's um, unusual. Why would I show you something I don't recommend? Well, this is a hawthorn, mm -hmm. uh, which is Crotigus and they're known to have diseases. And I bought this one because um, it's known to be disease resistant. However, it is diseased. And I, I love it. It turns brown in August and loses all its leaves and looks ugly. But in the spring, it's, it's, it's lovely. So just be cautious of not buying hot hawthorns to grow in this area. Okay. So I said I would show, explain a little bit more about um, how some shrubs can be trained as trees. This is my neighbor's house in the background. And this is a cypress that has grown very, very large. And I was thinking about moving this shrub, which is a styrix. But before I moved it, I decided I'm gonna see if I can train it um, to grow as a tree. I looked it up on the internet and it says this particular shrub can do that. So I took off all the bottom branches and left three stems. And you can see how it now fills the space mm -hmm. and it looks like a, uh, you know, a better shape for the area it was in. So I'm gonna see how it goes. And each year I'm watching it. I only did this a year ago to see um, how it responds to my drastic treatment. And I'm going to, uh, do you see that? Here we go. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. So um, if these evergreens weren't in the picture, um, you can see this is um, early spring. These trees haven't leafed out yet, how boring it would be. Um, so it's always good to have a mixture of evergreens and deciduous and not just deciduous. Um, I would like to add to that, Terry, because okay. I've had a discussion. I think it's extremely important when you figure that in Massachusetts, we have about six months of winter and it really is barren looking out there. And if you don't have the green of evergreens, you just have your, your sticks of your deciduous trees. So I was just talking to somebody the other day who wanted to have a barrier between her house and her neighbors. You could do a cluster of three with maybe two deciduous and an evergreen in front of them or two evergreens and a deciduous in front of them. And it could be lovely. You can have beautiful evergreens and then a gorgeous cornice in front of them. Um, but think of that, don't just immediately go to deciduous because they're really pretty in the spring. 
you got to live with them from November until April and maybe May. And that's a long time in the winter. Right. Uh, so definitely encourage that. Sorry. And, okay. and, and to add to that, um, that's especially true for foundation plantings. Oh, yes. Oh, very much so. Okay. So this is your typical Abavidi. One warning about um, the Abavidi is um, they should have the same sun exposure. If they don't, you'll see them growing um, like a, a downhill slope where they get more sun, they'll be a lot taller um, to, where, to where they're shaded. And, and you see a lot of Abavidi hedge kind of silly. Yeah, they do. <laughs> And just to show you some of the beautiful foliage that you can get on needled evergreens. This particular one I, I, I love and I love to share about it. It's about, um, oh, I'd say 10 feet tall. Back in the 70s, it was in a terrarium that I had. It was like two inches tall. Oh, what, what is it, you know? No, I don't know, I'm sorry. It's all right. It's, this is a short pine. So just, just quickly going through these, this is um, a cypress, yeah, very quick very growing. Um, so just quickly, that's all I'm gonna do on the uh, conifers. Um, to give you an idea of the variety that you can get when you go to, um, um, to, to buy them. You don't have to be stuck with something um, that everybody else has. So, um, Ashley, do you want to open it up for questions? Okay. Um, yes. Are there any questions here before we go into shrubs and vines? No. I had one. Ginkgo. Isn't ginkgo the tree that smells? If, if it's a female. Yeah. So yes. they supposedly don't sell males anymore. Okay. So wait a minute. The female smells and the male doesn't? Yep. Okay. Yep. I thought it was an unpleasant smell. Yes, it's supposed to be extremely unpleasant. It produces a nut. And actually the nut is edible and some um, cultures actually eat the nut and it smells gross. Oh, so, but if you grow it on the street and a lot of people often are looking for a tree to go on the street, yeah. this would be perfect because it can take the street exhaust, yes. and the pollution and the, so forth. And then you won't smell it so much as long as your house is farther away. Well, you just don't get a female. Oh, but you said they don't sell males anymore. No, they sell males. Oh, they okay. don't sell females. Oh, they don't sell females. Okay. So they're not supposed to sell females. How do they make trees then? <laughs> well, in the nursery, they have them, but they're, they're oh, okay. they, you don't see them. Supposedly, you're not supposed to see them in the trade. Uh-huh. Okay. You know, when I, every time I go to switch programs, I get, um, get popped out of sh sharing here. Yeah, I'm not sure why that's happening. I've never seen that happen, but uh, you're, you're back okay. on now. All right. I th okay, uh, I, th am, I think I'm okay now. Yeah, we see the folder. I don't think you, you may have to do the thing. Uh, I'll just. So let me just open this and. So is do that you, image loaded for you right now? Do you see a vine? I don't. I think you have to. I see. I think when I you're see. in the folder, you have to start sharing after you've clicked the image. It says ACT and Kalib. I think I am seeing clematis and so forth. I think I'm I seeing see a bunch of images. I just don't see the one that's. Yes, it says vines. It does say vines. Yeah. Uh, if you just restart your share, Terry, I'm not sure why it's having you do that. Okay, I when I finish one group of slides, I don't. I seem to pop out every time I go back. Yeah, okay. and we're back into the file again. Okay, she's uh, you're on the file and not in your pictures. No, oh, there, we go. there we go. Yep. Okay, there we go. I I'm I'm not sure what's happening. I'm not sure either, but I can at least edit it out. All right. right, and we have a question here, so it's probably somebody who knows what's happening. Um, what type of tree is good to use as a fence? And which store can you recommend to buy flowers and trees? Offhand, I would say, do you really want a tree as a fence or do you want right. a shrub? <laughs> right. 
Uh, which store can you recommend to buy flowers and trees? Mahoney's, Stonegate, uh, it depends where you live. Um, where do you recommend, Terry? Um, there's Northeast Nursery, there's Russell's. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, down on the Cape here, there's um, Crocker's and Brewster. Um, there's McHugh's here in Woburn, which doesn't have a lot, but it has very right. good stuff and they're good people. And uh, um, Arrowhead in Connecticut, you can, you know, you can take a trip down there. I hear they're wonderful. Yeah. I think one thing I would caution, I just heard, I was talking to a tree man recently and he said, too many people are putting great big tall trees right up against their house. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize how tall the tree is going to get. And then you're going to get into problems. Yeah. Because if it gets too tall and it's going to, the winds come and all of a sudden that branch goes down in your roof and you are an unhappy person. Yeah. Um, Mary Jane would like to know what other trees would we suggest for street screening? You know, um, Ashley, I think you, what you said is true. We don't use too many trees uh, for screening. It's mostly the shrubs that you use for the screening because a lot of trees are just have that single trunk and um, there's, there's not a lot of coverage um, until you get into the foliage of the tree, which may be up 10, 15 feet. So it's not um, a, a screening mechanism usually. Um, but if you go to a conifer like the cypress, that would be a good screener. Right if it's not too close to the street. Right, and that takes a lot of space. So you have to have a lot of space for that. Yeah, I live on a busy street um, and maybe uh, 30 feet from the street. Now we have tried a dogwood out there. We have tried a conifer out there. Both have died. We're doing a lot better with flowers, a statue and a small shrubs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the trees don't like what they're gonna get from the street. Um, it's, it's really too much for them. If you have a deep front lawn far enough away from the street, you can use the conifer and you could do a couple of arrangements. Like I talked, two conifers and a deciduous and so forth. Um, otherwise look to something else. Be very careful what you put out there. And don't do a Norway maple, whatever you do. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to vines. Okay, and there's just a few vines here, and I try to um, just pick out um, things that are a little bit unusual and very sturdy. And this is the, um, I, let me see if I can pronounce it uh, correctly, S Actindi, yeah. Anyways, it's a kiwi vine. And this one is a variegated one. And in the spring, it is especially colorful with pink and white and green variation. Hmm. And this is a very thick coverer. I have this growing on a pergola. This is the top of the pergola, looking down on top of it. And it creates enough shade to give it a good covering. Now, I wanted to identify if this was a male or a female, because you need both to get fruit. So I took a picture of the flower and looked it up on Google. And this flower is smaller than my baby fingernail and found out that it was a female. And so I planted this guy next um, to the growing one. And this is a male. And for the first year, I had baby kiwi fruit. They're about the size of grapes. That's the size it's supposed to be. And they taste like kiwi. So it was kind of a fun thing to do. It's cool. Yeah. Um, next, we're um, moving on to um, Sweet Autumn Clematis. Now, this is a great, great screening plant. This, um, if you have a chain link fence, you can um, plant this at the base and it would cover the chain link fence. It would grow up a wooden, wooden fence with a little bit of prompting. It makes a good screen and it grows very, very quickly. It blooms late in the season, um, late August, September, extremely fragrant and has a great seed pod. And this happens um, to be growing up. A, I had a tree cut down and I had it, the um, trunk left at 12 feet tall or so. 
I'm mm. sorry. There was a scratch that. That's another vine. Um, oh. that, but anyways, this is growing up a trellis and it acts as a screen for me. And it comes at a great time of year when a lot of other flowers are gone. Right. Um, this is another favorite. This is um, uh, a clematis as well. This is called Betty Corning. And I love Betty because she blooms for two to three full months. Mm. And I have it growing up, up, on a railing um, going up to a deck. Beautiful little blue bell flowers. And this is a uh, climbing hydrangea. And they're, um, they um, suck, they have suckers that grab onto concrete. So it's a great plant if you have um, some ugly concrete. You, I've seen some cinder block garages and it's, it's a great plant to, to um, cover that cinder block if you don't like that look. Hmm. And this is, uh, I apologize, but this is where I had a tree trunk cut to about here and the hydrangea was growing up, up the tree trunk. Um, and it can also grow up a living tree trunk without harming um, the tree that it climbs up. So it's a coarse looking flower. Um, it uh, doesn't bloom completely um, at the same time, but the little florets keep popping out over a long period of time. It's a very attractive vine. And lastly, this is um, a honeysuckle and very easy to grow and very long blooming and attracts butterflies and hummingbirds. So just, just a few finds um, to keep in mind. It's the same honeysuckle. Oh, that's a pretty picture. Yeah. And um, this vine, I'm going to see if I can pronounce it correctly, is um, Schizophragna. And it's also called false hydrangea vine. And this one is called Moonlight. And it's growing on a stucco wall that I have behind here. And it has the same suckering type stems that you don't need anything to get it climbing up a brick or stucco wall. And this particular variety glows. It actually glows. It's actually silvery. And it's very nice with the um, paint, uh, Japanese painted fern that's on the side here. Mm. And this is it at its beginning, just to show you how it just grabs onto that stucco and climbs up it. So you have to have the right place to grow these, but if you, if you do, uh, they add a lot of interest um, to the particular area. This particular vine also likes a partial shade. It won't do well in full hot sun. Okay, so now I'm gonna I'm going to see if I can um, get to my next folder without losing it. So. Yeah, we, we still got you here, so I think you're okay. Let's just see what happens when you open that. So we'll see. When I, now I see, do you see the butterfly? No, I don't know what I don't know what's happening here. Yeah, I think if you just restart the share while you got the image up, that will fix it. That's not oh, it. There, right? you go, there you go. There you go. Okay. All right. It might be just slow. That might be what it is. Yeah. So. Okay. So these are 12 of my favorite shrubs. Um, this is Budlier, also sometimes called summer lilac. And the reason I, I love this plant is that it collects butterflies. If I just want to be in, entertained, all I have to do is put a chair out and look at my butterfly bush. And um, it's always covered with butterflies. So it's like a double whammy there. You get the beautiful purple flowers and you get the uh, gorgeous butterflies. I know in some areas it's invasive, but it's not in my garden. Every now and then I get a seedling or two, but it's not invasive. Um, this is Calicopia. And 
um, it's not exciting. The foliage uh, is not exciting, I should say, um, but I love growing this plant and I'll show you why. And the flowers are not exciting. They're very small, but it's these beautiful berries that are electric violet and they happen in October and in November. And they're good to um, put in vases indoors, but the, um, but the color of the berries is just so totally outstanding that it's worth putting up with the plain foliage. Another shrub that I really like is Echiantis. Mm. And I like this shrub, it has lantern type flowers, but you can see how beautiful the delicate foliage is. Um, so it, was, um, it blooms in May, close up of um, the flowers. And I believe this variety is called showy lanterns. Okay, so we're talking about screening and this is my all time favorite plant for screening. And it's um, Euonymus. There are many varieties of Euonymus. You know, they, um, you see them as ground covers that are in yellow and gold and green and white, low growing uh, shrubs. But this is a tall growing one. And in the spring, it's covered with these tiny white flowers. The foliage is evergreen, it's shiny um, and bright and, and, and brilliant. Um, and this one here uh, will grow tall. In the fall, it has these unusual colored um, pods with berries in them. They're, they're pink and coral mixed together. And this is the shrub in its whole form. And I wanted to show you how well it screens out the, the neighbor's house on the other side of my property. <laughs> Can't even see it. And it's very quick growing. I've seen this available at Lowe's and Home Depot and even at um, Walmart. So it's easy to get hold of. And another great feature is that you can use that foliage, the evergreen foliage uh, throughout the holiday season because it stays green for a very, very long time in water and sometimes out of water. Terry? Yeah? You say that's euonymus. And a lot of euonymus we think of as being invasive. I know I ate, inherited a lot when I bought this house. Now, do you have a name, a, more, a longer name for that one, a real name? This one I, uh, is Manhattan. Manhattan, okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's not invasive. It will spread and it will grow. But um, if you're using it for screening, it, it's perfect. Yeah, well, I know. The, matter of fact, the invasive euonymus is a perfect for screening too. Yeah. <laughs> that's not, um, that one isn't um, evergreen. So this being evergreen is wonderful. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, and we're familiar with hydrangea. Hydrangea um, could be a whole talk on itself, but I'm just quickly going to go through um, a few varieties of hydrangea. This is your typical mop head. This is in blue. Uh, this is in a pink and white variety. This one is uh, called Blue Wave. This is Serrata, the variety of this. And this is a um, very dependable bloomer. It doesn't grow tall. It only grows about four feet tall, um, but it does change color. And it's hard to believe that this blue turns into this wine color um, as the season progresses and the foliage begins being tinged with wine. This is your standard paniculata. And these, this particular variety can be cut down to the ground and it will pop up again and bloom um, by fall. And it has great panicles that begin um, blooming white, and then they turn pink as the season progresses. These are the flowers that you can uh, pick um, and dry and have them in the house over the winter. And this is um, limelight, which is another variety of paniculata. There are many, um, these are dependable bloomers. There are many uh, colors and varieties available. 
And this is um, the Corsifolia, which is oak leaf hydrangea. And I love this plant. This plant can be a great screener. Um, it grows very um, large, it grows about 10 feet tall, and it can grow 10 feet wide. And it has these beautiful cones of white flowers in August that turn color as the season progresses, as does the foliage. The foliage will get bright red and it will um, eventually turn into a rusty brown and the flowers will get rust, rusty -er. And as a screen, you if you're using this as a screen, it needs a lot of space. It needs, um, it needs, uh, I would say at least uh, half shade. It wouldn't like being in a sunny spot, but it was certainly, even though it's deciduous, it would certainly act as a screen um, because of its twigginess um, in through through the winter, but especially um, from spring um, to fall, it's a great plant for screening. We're moving on to Hypernicum, and this is a semi-shrub. Um, it's not totally a shrub, it's not totally a perennial. It does have dieback, and it needs to be cut back somewhat in the spring. And these um, Hypernicums, or St. John's wort, are now coming in many, many different colors and foliage. This one is Ashberry Purple. I love it because it has these bright yellow flowers in the spring with coral berries and they start turning black as the season progresses and the foliage starts getting tinged with wine and um, eventually um, blackberries. Mm. And the, it grows, um, it's nice for the front of a border. It grows about two to three feet tall. I was um, in a nursery um, down the Cape recently and was tempted by so many uh, uh, different varieties of them. Well worth trying. This one is um, called Brigadoon and it's a different habit. It's only about um, 15 inches tall and it stays this bright yellow, but doesn't do much other than that. But still, I like, I like where it is. This shrub is called Caria, and it has very nice foliage. As you can see, it's um, lined and um, uh, uh, spear shaped. And in spring, it has yellow flowers. It's also called Easter Rose. Another picture of it. And um, another, you can see, it's, and it also grows under trees which is very unusual. So if you, you have a space under a tree and you, um, you don't wanna fill it in, this is a good consideration. And the thing I like about it is in the spring, I mean, in the winter, uh, after all the foliage is gone, it maintains its green twiggy structure. So you have these green twigs growing in vase shape um, to give you interest uh, when it's not in bloom or, it, or when the foliage is gone. Okay, now this is a plant that I'm, is fairly new to me. I've only had it grow. I've only had it growing for about five years. It's called Nandina, or heavenly bamboo, and it comes in different color variations, and it's evergreen. Hmm. And here it is in red a reddish color, and here it is in winter, and it stays with its foliage on, and it's, um, it, uh, it, it, it doesn't spread, it just grows in a clump. Oops, and here is my newest version um, that I just bought this past spring, trying it in a pot to see how it does. Hmm. Very, very nice plant so far. Okay, so I'm moving on to Physicopus, which is nine bark. And this, I believe, is a great substitute for the lilac. You know, it has much more interest. It isn't boring. It can also be used as a screening. It comes in different colors. This one is called Diablo because you can see the foliage here is very, uh, very, very black. 
And in the spring, it's covered with these flowers, white flowers, followed by most of the summer by this packet of um, little red tiny, um, almost like berries. And in the fall, it has a um, rusty red color that's very attractive and more of the foliage in the fall. Lastly, um, is, this is spirea. And this spirea, I think many of you recognize as bridal wreath. It's cut out of favor now. It's very twiggy, hard to um, manage, etc. But there are so many beautiful spireas um, that you could, um, you, you just can't tire of them, in my opinion. I know a lot of people don't like them, but I love them. Um, I believe this is Anthony Waterer, and you can see the variation on the foliage up in the corner here, and the variation in the flower color um, while it's in bloom. These spireas um, don't need much pruning. They only grow about three to four feet tall, depending upon the variety that you buy. Um, this one is gold flame. It come, uh, um, in the spring, the foliage starts out bright gold and kind of um, gets more to a medium green as the summer progresses. And here's some fall foliage of spirea. And if you like bright pink, this one is called neon. I have this growing in quite a bit of shade and yet it still produces these brilliant hot pink flowers. Um, again, only growing about three to four feet tall. And my favorite spirea is Argon, O-G-O-N. And the more sun you give the spirea, the more yellow it will remain through the growing season. In very early spring, it produces these very long sprays of white flowers. And this one happens to be growing on top of a tulip bed. Hmm. Another spirea here, you can see the foliage is like a minty green, striated with white in it. Um, and after the flowers are gone, you still have this gorgeous foliage. Another spirea with um, puffs of white, delicate, lacy flowers. Close up of the flowers. Okay, and now moving on to viburnums, which are one of my, I, I keep saying favorite, but one of my go-to shrubs. This viburnum is a double file. There are several uh, varieties of double file viburnums. And what, what that means is the flowers go down the stems in a file of two. Uh, and I wanted to show you the difference between, this can be grown right down to the ground. And this was trimmed up about three feet um, tall. And here it is trimmed up to about five feet tall so that I could walk under it. This is a good shrub um, to look down upon. If you have a deck or a sloping area, um, you get the full advantage of it blooming in May. It blooms for a very, very long time. Uh, and the, um, it has... Um, very nice foliage, a different type leaf, close up of the flowers. And the super advantage are these beautiful red berries and the birds absolutely love them. They'll, they spend about a month clearing the bush of all, all the red berries and a close up of the berries. And not only do viburnums have red berries, you can get them with blueberries. And this one is called Brandy Wine, and it has um, at different times pink and blueberries on the same um, shrub. Mm -hmm. This viburnum is I called uh, Japanese Snowball. It um, it has um, uh, pink sensation is the um, particular name of this one. And just love the way the flowers are um, so vibrant. This is a uh, Korean uh, snowball, a viburnum. It starts off in the spring with green flowers that turn white. Hmm. And you'll see um, them used in this stage of green very often in flower arrangements. Yep. And 
And lastly, uh, my 12th favorite shrub is Wajelia. And I like Wajelia. Again, it only grows, um, depending upon the variety, uh, three, four, five feet. And I like it because of its long blooming. The flowers are uh, very um, showy. And the foliage uh, comes in different variations or plain. I don't know why you would want to get plain when you can, you know, enjoy uh, the variegation. So um, this is with the dark green splash with lime green exterior on the leaf. Pretty. With, uh, um, pink flower. And on this one here, we have a dark green with, um, um, oh, a light green exterior and the flowers range from um, white actually to deep pink. Hmm. And this isn't in the best of shape of the slide to show you the variation you can get on Wajelias. And this one is called Wine and Roses. Um, the foliage being um, a, a dark wine color. And that's it for my top 12. And I have 12 more if you want to see them or we can do questions, whatever works. We don't really have any questions. So if you want to whip through your 12, and I'll tell you one thing I was surprised you didn't have is my favorite was Holly. I always recommend Holly to people because- Yes, yeah, the next 12. Oh, okay, the next one. <laughs> and I know everybody really recommends nine bar. And they say nine bars. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. You know, I made a, um, a list of um, nine back. Um, oh, here we go. Um, these are the colors that comes in. Amber Jubilee, gold orange, summer wine, dark burgundy, center glow, golden yellow center surrounded by purple. Wow. Tina, coppery purple. And it goes on and on and on. So you can get the nine back in almost any color. And people recommend it as a very easy shrub. Yes, it's very, very easy. Okay. And also they come in miniature. If you can't cope with um, the, um, the, the large size, you can get them to grow very short. But I, I, I think the large ones are prettier. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, we got about eight minutes left. So why don't you do a quick whip through so everybody can see what can be... Found. Okay, I'm going to see if we well, can, more. Yeah, if we can. No, do you see the Ozalea slide? I No, I see your file. Yeah, okay. Do you see it now? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. I figured out what I needed to do. Okay. Um, this is Azalea. And this is a woodland azalea. It's deciduous. It's not the azalea that you see in neat little clumps in front of houses. Um, and this grows the edge of the woodland. This is another one. Mm, pretty. Yeah. And, and very nice, very free flowing, different from your manicured azaleas. Yeah, I don't like the manicured ones. So this is the holly. This is the regular holly. This is um, Cranata, very small leafed evergreen. Mm -hmm. um, very, it looks very much like boxes of boxwood, mm -hmm. but um, they're recommending people not use boxwood anymore because of um, diseases and um, the difficulty in sharing it compared to the Ilex granata. So Ilex is holly, and this is the regular holly. A great screening. Both of these are great for screening. Yep. You oh. need a male and a female. Except um, my daughter just bought one that had comes in both. Yeah, I didn't know that. This is actually the Cronada. The Cronada doesn't need uh, male and female. It has little small berries. This is um, the, the, the holly that needs the male and the female. This is uh, Blue Girl. Yeah. That's and it makes a green screen. This screening covers um, a work area that I have. Yep. Uh, this is Caryopteris. And I don't like the regular blue one, but I like this one because I love the foliage. It's variegated. It stays green and white all season. Very pretty. Um, this is flowering quince. This is your standard variety. It grows um, kind of weedy. It's good for an edge of a property, but not in a garden bed because it, 
um, suckers a lot, but it's very, it's um, um, just so brilliant in the spring. I love it when it starts blooming. It means the Baltimore air, Orioles are coming. And it also produces fruit, which you can use, although it's not the recommended variety for fruit. Uh, the fruit is kind of special to me because I used to have a retriever who would pick the quince and um, want to play ball with it. Yes. And uh, there are hybrids. They only grow three to four feet tall. They come in nice colors. This is a white one, a peach one, and a red one. Those are the kinds that I would recommend for borders. Contini aster um, grows in different heights um, from you know a tall tree to a, a small shrub. And this takes a great deal of salt so it can be used along the streetway. It will survive um, um, plows and things like that. So, um, so it's good, good to be aware of. And again, it's ever, some of them are evergreen and usually covered with fruit. This is cantinus or smoke bush. And I keep this uh, copus, which means I cut it down every year so that it maintains its um, coppery foliage. This is foliage emerging early in spring, as well as this. And um, it, um, because the foliage is new, it's that nice, beautiful color, but then it fades out to green as the, the season progresses. Daphne's are, um, they can be iffy. Um, sometimes they disappear for no reason at all. This is called summer ice. I think they're worth growing um, and you just have to put up with them, not putting up with you. <laughs> and this is um, February Daphne, which does begin blooming as early as February. Huh. And I lost this one too, but I'm gonna plant another one. Where a lot of people are familiar with Paris, which is also known as Andromeda. And this now comes, this is your standard old fashioned one, comes in um, different colors, uh, Valentine, which is red and pink and different heights. But it has this, these beautiful um, drooping flowers in the spring. Okay, okay. I, I already talked about Hallie Jove a lot, but I put her in here as a shrub. So I'm just gonna fly through her. Oh, there's another picture of the Paris. I'm sorry, that was out of order. And roses. Now, I'm, I don't grow tea roses. I, I don't like to be bothered with them being so fussy. But this is your typical knockout rose, which is an easy to grow shrub. It uh, blooms faithfully. You don't have to do anything to it. Uh, it comes back every year. The, uh, it can make a nice uh, border of roses. Matter and, of fact, I have them near the street. Yeah. And um, this is a, another carpet rose. And these roses here are, are special to me. Oh. These um, were Lowe's um, homegrown roses. And what this Mr. Lowe did many years ago was you would order the rose, old fashioned roses you wanted. And he grew them on their own rootstock, which is very unusual. And you would pick them up um, a year and a half later to grow. So I had, I've had these um, for many years from him. Wow. And these, some of these are fragrant um, and, and again, very old, old fashioned roses. They're not your typical tea roses. And lilac or syringa. And who would ever want to grow a common lilac is beyond me because I think they're so ugly. However, if you get into hybrids, you get so much more. This one here is called Sensation. And this one is Beauty of Moscow. Hmm. And this is, I believe my last slide. Yes. And this is your uh, hybrid pussy willow. And this is an ugly shrub, but the pussy willows are fantastic. And, um, my grandkids would love bringing these by the fistfuls into the teachers. Any, any, anyone I say, would you like some pussy willows? Says yes. 
Yeah. They're just great for gift giving. And this is on the edge of a property where I don't care what the tree looks like, but um, I, I love it because I love the pussy willows. So that's, that's it. Hurrah. And the pussy willows take water, as I remember. Yes, I this, is, this is growing in a wet area. Yeah. So for those of you who have wet, boggy fields, you might think of them. Terry, that was wonderful. You certainly give us a lot to think about. Um, I have little things down here of plants I'd like to plant, and I don't have any room left. And where am I going to put them? And what am I going to take out? Uh, yeah. Next week, Terry will be with us to finish up flowers from H to Z. I, we got as far as A to G, and there was so much there that we added on another program. So come join us to see Terry again with flowers and add, bring your questions and see what you can do. This is a good time to look at all of this because this is when the catalogs are coming out when the sales are there in the nursery, if you want to go buy trees or shrubs, it's a good time to go check it out. So have a good week, everybody. And Terry, we thank you. So glad to see you again. Enjoy the rest of the week. Be careful during the storm. Bye-bye, <laughs> all. Bye. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Ashley. This program was recorded. It will be on our YouTube page. Thank you, everyone, for coming.